Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you for the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council for providing the opportunity. Um, also want to acknowledge the sponsors, and I'm going to limit the amount of marketing that I do as a representative of Barrenbrook, but I will mention the King's Agri-Seeds is one of our distributors. So if for no other reason I encourage you to visit David at the King's Agri-Seeds booth because I've got a stack of business cards back there and you can find some contact information back there, but you can also find a lot of good information about forages. So that's the end of the overt sales pitch, okay? Good, all right. So I I've chosen this title, Beef the Real Health Food, for a couple reasons. One is I want to kind of shake people's paradigms a little bit. I want to get people to re-examine some of their core beliefs, things that they implicitly believe but have never really thought about much. Uh, I also want to challenge the idea that beef is somehow a negative factor in the human diet. You'll hear a lot about this going on today uh, through presentations that I'll give or that some of the other speakers will give, um, but there's a lot of nonsense out there, I think is one word I could use in polite society, to describe the idea that beef no longer is a part of a healthy diet, okay? And we'll talk some about that. Also, um, well, let's just start with this. I'm here to perform a service, and that service is to get people thinking not necessarily to get you indoctrinated, not to sell you on what I think, but I want you to start, take, uh, take some of the information that you'll get today, take it away, think about it, look into some of the sources, and then decide, okay? And, but hopefully what we can do is we can kill some errors, because there's some really massive errors that have been directing public policy to an astonishing degree for well over, you know, 40 years now. So we perhaps rather than come up with something new, we ought to do some culling. And people in the beef industry are aware of culling. I think it's time to do that intellectually. As we go on this pattern, we are going to be confronting some sacred cows, but don't worry, it's okay. Some good can come from killing sacred cows. So let's start with the group participation aspect of the program. If I say healthy diet, what kinds of things come to your mind? Whole grains, Whole grains is here. Others? Fresh fruits, okay, more? Vegetables, more? Fish, okay? Beef, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry? T-bone, okay, yeah, we're on a theme here. <laughs> Balance is an idea that you'll frequently hear. Moderation is frequently an idea that you'll hear. A lot of people are saying, you know, eat plants, right? Eat food, mostly plants, not too much, right, Michael Pollan? Plant-based diet is supposed to be healthy. Well, are all those beliefs justified other than the beef, of course? <laughs> Where do we get those ideas? Why do we believe those to be true? Are we justified in giving those our belief? Unfortunately, in the United States, a healthy diet is largely defined and has been since the late 70s with what's called the heart healthy diet. Those two have become synonymous. Is that a valid position? Is the heart healthy diet as popularly understood grounded in science? Okay, here's one representation of the heart healthy diet. How many people here are in agriculture? Okay, how many people here are from a non-ag background? Do we have people here that are dietitians or nutritionists looking for continuing education? I don't mean to call you out, I just need to know myself. Okay, so primarily an ag audience, primarily an animal agriculture audience, a ruminant agricultural audience. So, what are the products of ruminant agriculture? Red meat, dairy, okay, beef, sheep, goats, doesn't matter. Those are the products. So, where on this graph that, or this figure that's supposed to represent proportions of what your diet should be made up of, where do your products end up on this? At the top, at the eat less, or at the bottom, eat more? 
eat less. They're up at the top. These people believe that there's something fundamentally harmful about the products of your efforts and your industry. Is that justified? How did we come to believe it? Interesting journey. And considering the fact that the beef industry is the largest source of new wealth generation in the United States, <laughs> therefore a significant source of tax revenue, the fact that this was paid for by your efforts to minimize the importance of your products, eh, we might want to look at that just a little bit. So again, I mentioned health food, problematic history with America Health Food. Uh, this picture was taken on Main Street, Pella, Iowa. Uh, here, it's all here. It's a holistic health and nutrition center, health food store. If you could read the glass, it says gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, raw cafe. And there's all the buzzwords you could possibly want. You look up the, word, the phrase health food and you get a definition like this. Any natural food popularly believed to promote or sustain good health as by containing vital nutrients, being grown without the use of pesticides, or having a low sodium or fat content. Well, it's all there and there's lots that we could talk about. Let's look at the fat issue, shall we? Uh, but also notice the time frame that they place as an origin for this. Anybody know what else was going on then? But health food also has a label aspect, right? A label claim aspect. And, and from the government's point of view, it has to be low in fat and saturated fat, limited in the amount of sodium and cholesterol, and then provide some relatively small amount of some nutrients to qualify for a label claim as being a healthy food. Is that justified? Where did that come from? Well, some of you may recognize some of these individuals, if not by picture, then by name. Anybody remember milk break in kindergarten? Anyone? Okay. Did you get a cracker with your milk? What kind of cracker was it? It was his cracker. That was his health food. He developed that to treat all of the illnesses that he saw in his day. Several decades later, we had another man whose name you should recognize show up on the scene. And he was another religious advocate for a vegetarian lifestyle. And to produce a health-inducing food, we have cornflakes and we have all of the rest of those products. Do we, are we aware of this when we sit down to the breakfast table? I'm here to push the point a little bit more. I'm not here to say that meat can cure everything, but let's look at the definition of medicine. It's a substance that's used in treating disease or relieve pain. That's one definition. I'm here to suggest that a diet containing animal products restricted in carbohydrates is one that will treat disease and relieve pain in many, many cases. So we're justified. Anybody remember oat bran? Okay, that whole craze with fiber. Interesting story there, can't take the time to really go into it, but let's just assume now that we could show in a clinical trial the following improvements in health markers. Okay? That's what we're showing. We've got two treatments here. We're contrasting two different diets. And so, first of all, we demonstrate that we've got this greater body mass loss, lost more weight. We lost more abdominal fat because, as many people should know, Abdominal fat represents a different risk than fat in other parts of the body. It, it produced this dramatic decrease in, in triglycerides in the bloodstream. It, this significant increase in high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, we'll get to that, Again, because we've decreased triglycerides and we've increased HDL cholesterol, we've produced this dramatic improvement in the ratio between those two, which is now understood to be a far better predictor of heart disease risk 
than simply looking at LDL cholesterol or total cholesterol. This has got to do with the, pro the, the lipoprotein particle size, and so you want to reduce your ApoAB to ApoA ratio, and we did that, and then that's reflected in the small LDL particles. So more is not good in this. We've reduced them. The other diet increased them. Okay, so this is a significant health improvement. We've reduced circulating blood glucose levels. We've reduced dramatically circulating or, 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 or fasting blood insulin levels. That's a significant improvement. And remarkably, we've reduced the circulating saturated fatty acids in the blood. Now, imagine we've produced all those improvements. And it was anything other than fat and saturated fat in the diet that was doing it. What kind of advertising campaign could you imagine promoting this? I mean, oat bran was produced on nothing. <laughs> and it was a huge, huge effort and success and marketing campaign. And you in the meat industry are producing a product which if it was eaten in larger amounts than is currently recommended so long as carbohydrate was restricted has been shown to produce this kind of result. I call that health food. We know the grass makes meat, we know the grass makes milk, I hope that's not too revolutionary a statement in here, not everyone does, I understand that, but okay fine. The problem is that we're, sell we're not selling grass. We may be grass farmers, but we got to convert it into a saleable product. And then we have to try to sell that product into a marketplace that's thoroughly prejudiced. And how did we come to fear fat? How did we develop what I've I, I and others call lipophobia? Fear of fat, animal fat, a perfectly natural substance that's been part of the human experience for as long as we have been humans. How did that suddenly become a source of disease? Was that justified? How good was the evidence that led us to make that decision? So today, what if what we've been told is not only wrong but harmful? Two different things. It's one thing to be wrong, right? We're all human. But what if we actually cause harm by being wrong? And what if beef, Virginia grown, of course, could be shown to be part of the solution? And we'll talk about what the problem is as we go along. But you probably are aware that many people talk about us being in the grip of a diabetes epidemic. We'll talk about that. And what if research had demonstrated this fact over 50 years ago? Might that be of interest to you? Should that be interest, of interest to the general public? How do we bridge the gap between production agriculture and the general public? So objectives, I want to demonstrate that there's this huge gap between scientific literature and public policy, dietary advice, and I want to explain why this matters to us, to our industry, to Virginia and the U.S. and the rest of the world. But first a quiz. So I tried to get you warmed up earlier, right? So you're stretched, you shouldn't strain anything. How many people know what this is? Show of hands, come on. Come on, don't be shy. Wow, okay. So, so this is an auto lancet for taking blood samples, right? You prick your finger, you get a blood drop. You can then test blood glucose with it in the home. There are other meters, other strips. You can test blood ketones, okay? In about five years, the prediction by CDC is that 50% of adult Americans are either going to be diabetic or pre-diabetic. This is a huge healthcare problem. This is the unsustainable burden that's coming at us. Already, and this is 2007 data, the estimated costs were $174 billion a year, direct and indirect. Direct medical costs were $116 billion. Seventh leading cause of death in the United States, but I'm going to make the case that this is a low number because they're only looking at overt diabetes. And I believe that diabetes is part of a constellation of, of diseases, okay? So it's probably bigger than this. It's probably worse than this. If I say cholesterol, do you think harmful or do you think healthy? 
Come on, people, work with me here. Most people think harmful. We've been taught that, haven't we? How many people have heard of good cholesterol? Okay, and I wager to say about the same number have heard of bad cholesterol, right? Is that a justified description of cholesterol? So how many people know the three-letter acronym associated with the so-called bad cholesterol? LDL. LDL, and LDL stands for low-density lipoprotein. Oh, wait, the word cholesterol doesn't appear in there. Isn't that interesting? Uh, what's the three-letter acronym for the good cholesterol? HDL, and that stands for high-density lipoprotein. And once again, remarkably, cholesterol doesn't appear in that name. So, apparently we're talking about the cholesterol that's contained in LDL particles and the cholesterol that's contained in HDL particles. Cholesterol is not soluble in water. It has to be packaged into these lipoprotein boats so it can sail out it through the, the circulatory system. So what's the difference between the cholesterol that's in an HDL molecule, uh, particle and the cholesterol that's in an LDL particle? And don't say one's good and one's bad. <laughs> it's cholesterol. It's the same molecule. If it weren't, then they'd have to call it something different. Isn't that remarkable? OK, maybe just to me. I know, I'm a geek, but we're stuck here, so let's make the best of it. Um, saturated fat, if I say that phrase, does the modifying phrase artery clogging spring to mind? Right, all four words seemingly have to all go together anytime you talk about saturated fat. Does saturated fat clog your arteries? Is there any science to support that idea? Remember the ad pouring the bacon grease down the sink? If you did that in your mama's kitchen, she'd smack you for being stupid. OK, another test. Which of these, which mammals are designed to digest a low-fat diet? We got two groups. We got sheep, we got cattle, we got mountain gorilla. That's the group A now. Don't jump ahead of me. Okay, group A is those three animals. Group B is made up of homo sapiens, lions, and then this polar bear protecting his iceberg from disastrous anthropogenic global climate change. <laughs> How many people believe that group A is designed to digest a low-fat diet? Show of hands. Come on, this is minimum exercise, y'all. Okay, how many people think group B? How many people by this time are strongly suspecting a trick question? It's, yeah, it's, it's C, <laughs> because there's a difference between digest and ingest. And such are the subtle distinctions that we have to watch for in the conversation. Because these animals clearly ingest a low-fat diet. A cow grazing grass is less than 5% ether extract, right? Okay, what are two principal products of rumen fermentation? You all said you were beef people, right? <laughs> so, so you should know this answer. Two, two principal products, rumen fermentation. We got microbial protein, right? We can take non-protein nitrogen sources and convert them into microbial protein. That's a huge ecological advantage. Number two is volatile fatty acids. Short chain, entirely saturated, by the way. Do cows get heart disease? OK, so now the animal absorbs those volatile fatty acids. At the end of the day, so she digests them. So by the end of the day, about 60% of her energy ends up coming from the fatty acids that she produces thanks to pregastric fermentation. They ingest a low-fat diet. They digest a high-fat diet. Well, we're an omnivore, and these are carnivores, and we don't have rumens, and we don't have enlarged cecums. We have to ingest fat in our diet. And certain specific fats have to be in our diet, just like certain specific amino acids have to be in our diet. I'm going to challenge everyone to think about this one before they jump too quickly to the answer, right? If you see a heavy person, do you think a lazy glutton 
or do you think perturbed metabolism? This one's kind of harsh, I admit. But if you subscribe to the official dietary policy of the United States government and many, many health advocacy groups, you believe the former. You believe that people are obese because they overeat and don't exercise enough. Well, that's another way of saying lazy glutton, isn't it? You may be interested to know that most studies that compare normal and overweight people suggest that those who are overweight eat fewer calories. Isn't that interesting? Yet we're told to eat less and exercise more. Exercise doesn't make you lean. Exercise makes you hungry. Our grandparents talked about working up an appetite, yet that's supposed to be the weight loss regimen. So, so I'm particularly struck by the slogan across the back of her t-shirt, knowledge is power. Yeah, but if it's a lie, right? You can believe a lie, and then you're imprisoned by it. Do you believe if we put a basset on a treadmill, we'll turn him into a greyhound? <laughs> Biology and genetics is not fair. And I did hear one person say that they got into genealogy to find out who to blame. <laughs> we have no control over the genotype. What we do have some control over is the expression of that genotype, the phenotype, the interaction with the environment. And food is the primary regulator of that interaction, isn't it? We, but we have to have the information that allows us to make the right choices. There's a lot of stuff out there. You'll find some people saying something as silly as this. Those of you who are in ruminant agriculture should know that that's not true. Uh, for example, this is grass, this is not grass. I mean, really? <laughs> It, it's, again, a subtle distinction, but there are vast, vast power bases that are built on this kind of nonsense. So what we need to understand is that the very first diet ever publicized to treat obesity was published in the 1860s. And it was a carbohydrate-restricted diet. And from that point, up through the 60s and 70s, it was the accepted means of treating obesity. And there's various forms that come out, but they're all basically the same thing. And then something happened. We went from, in the 30s, poor health being blamed on a lack of meat and dairy in the diet. We went from, in the 60s, where a statement like this could appear in the British Journal of Nutrition, written by the two preeminent British nutritionists. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge, which few nutritionists would dispute. Well, something happened. We swapped paradigms in the 60s. We swapped the paradigm of the fattening carbohydrate for the paradigm that dietary fat causes heart disease. And it was a huge mistake. And mistake is a kind word. I might call it scandal, deception, any number of other descriptors are possible when you read the story that Nina Teicholz so well puts out in her book, The Big Fat Surprise. There are other books, and we'll talk about them. <clears throat> when you have conflicting pieces of information. So, so what we had was the well-established paradigm that said that carbohydrates are the macronutrient that makes humans fat. Now we have this new competing thought that it's dietary fat that makes heart disease. You can't have both of those at the same time. Something has to go. And every, every other area of medicine swung into alignment with the idea that fat in the diet leads to heart disease. Even weight loss. And then you can see the lengths that people go to to try to explain why their advice doesn't mesh with the observations. Dietary therapy remains the cornerstone of treatment. The reduction of energy intake continues to be the basis of successful weight reduction programs. Eat less exercise more. A few paragraphs later in this same document, the results of such energy reduced restricted diets, quote, are known to be poor and not long lasting. That's the cornerstone. 
There might be another explanation. Maybe the basis of their therapy is flawed. And again, this has contaminated many, many other areas of science. I don't want to bring up any bad memories for anyone who had to go through college biochemistry and mention Leninger's principles of biochemistry. It'll be okay. We'll get through this together. On page 930 of this book, you find the following. And this is the latest edition. Seems to me we've got two questions here. And there are different ways of asking the same question. What makes, people, what makes fat tissue fat and what makes people fat are the same question, just sort of asked in different ways. In one, at one, you're looking at a more whole system. In the other, you're looking at the specific tissue where fat is stored. But it's essentially the same thing because, obviously, obesity is an excess of fat accumulation. Well, when we're talking about just the biochemistry, we get this explanation that high blood glucose elicits the release of insulin, which speeds the uptake of glucose by tissues and favors the storage of fuels as glycogen and triacylglycerols while inhibiting fatty acid mobilization in adipose tissue. Insulin makes you fat. Carbohydrate in the diet drives insulin. OK, so what makes, fat, what makes people fat? We're not even talking half a page later, and we come up with this. To a first approximation, obesity is the result of taking in more calories in the diet than are expended by the body's energy-consuming activities. People are fat because they overeat and don't exercise enough. Those are two opposing, those are not the same statements. In no way are those two statements in agreement. And yet, that close, and there's no sort of twinge <laughs> that, how, how are we going to say this? For a generation, research on heart disease has been more political than scientific. But I have to point out that this was written by a man or in 1978. So for two generations, <laughs> the discussion of or research on heart disease has been more political than scientific. It is now acknowledged that neither dietary nor serum cholesterol represent a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. You've heard this, right? Anybody here had their doctor talk to them about their cholesterol? If you've heard about one of these massive epidemiological studies, it's probably Framingham. What you may not have heard is that for each 1% decrease in uh, cholesterol, there was an increase in overall and coronary disease mortality. Oh, that's awkward. But they're not deterred. So another brief review. There are three macronutrients in the human diet. We've got fat and protein and carbohydrate. For those of us in ruminant agriculture, which, of those, which two of those three are of primary concern? Come on, come on. Protein is one. Fat is the other. Now, protein is going to stay relatively constant, even across a wide range of diets. And you'll hear some information later, perhaps, about our behavior relative to getting the protein that we need. But if you're going to, therefore, drive fat down in the diet, you, by definition, are going to drive carbohydrate up. They're inversely related. So take home message. The next time somebody talks to you about a low-fat diet, just automatically translate that into high-carbohydrate diet. You're talking about the same thing. But at the same time, you need to know that there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in the human diet. There are essential amino acids. There are essential fatty acids. If anyone talks to you about how you need 120 or 130 grams of glucose a day, what they've just told you is they don't understand the difference between endogenous and exogenous sources of glucose. The body can make the glucose it's, it needs so long as it has adequate fat and is burning fat as a primary fuel source to make ketones, and then has enough protein to make glucose out of amino acids. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in the human diet. And yet, 
Okay, we're, we're in the midst of this diabetes or di diabetes epidemic, type 2 diabetes primarily. How much sugar, how much glucose is circulating in the bloodstream of a typical healthy adult male? And this is, you, some people argue with this demonstration, it helps me. Basically, if you're at 100 milligrams per deciliter of blood glucose, for that typical healthy male, 100 is frequently a dividing line between normal and pre-diabetic at least. You're talking about 5 grams. A teaspoon is 4 grams. If you go above 126 milligrams per deciliter, you now qualify as a diagnosis of diabetes. That's a difference. That's 6 grams total. You're talking a quarter teaspoon difference in your bloodstream. And then if we look at what we get from various items that are frequently consumed, the wonder is that we're not all diabetic. If you can digest the carbohydrate, it's going to become glucose. The question is time and rate, but it's going to happen. Starch digests to glucose. Sucrose breaks down to glucose and fructose. They all get absorbed. Why would anyone be eating that much? Well, because we've been told to. The, the, the dietary guidelines that were released in 2010 have these statements. Uh, they're suggesting that we should limit our fat intake to less than 30% calories uh, and that our saturated fat content should be somewhere south of 7 calories, percent of calories. Uh, we should restrict our intake of cholesterol to less than we would get from two large eggs a day. So let's just pause again and say, where, what's the primary source for saturated fat in the American diet? Plants or animals? Animals. And where's the primary source of cholesterol in the, anybody's diet? Animals. So those are just two different, those are just three different ways to say eat less animal products. And then we say to explicitly, because carbohydrates come from plants, so here's another way to say eat less animal products. We're supposed to get 60% of our calories from carbohydrates, a substance that we have no essential need for. And then we get to where we just come right out and say we're going to promote the use of low-fat meat and lean meat and meat substitutes. Well, you may or may not have heard that there's an active effort to even remove lean meat from a healthy diet. And we'll talk about that going on. So this all started in the 70s with the Senate report that then led to the creation of dietary guidelines. Really hasn't changed much. Adele Haidt is going to talk about this coming up, so let me just pass by. But let me also say that if you look from 1960 until the mid-70s, we were tracking extremely obese, obese, and overweight in the population. We were told to shift our diet. They had this story about how the shift would take us back toward a more healthy, natural diet, more like our ancestors ate. And we were to do that to avoid obesity and chronic illness. Now there's many possible explanations for what happened following the institution of the guidelines. Let's have that conversation. But the first thing we ought to look at is the dietary guidelines came out there. And we have not improved, and we have followed their advice. Adele will talk about that coming up. In Virginia today, this is the, the toll, if you will. Almost two-thirds of your adults are overweight or obese. Almost 30% are obese. That ranks you 15th. Ten, almost 10.5% 10 have diabetes, ranks you 11th. Almost a third have hypertension. That ranks you 23rd. By the way, you don't want to be number one on this list. <laughs> different kind of thing. High school students, 17% are overweight, 11% are obese. Your high school students. And of your children between 10 and 17, almost a third are either overweight or obese, which ranks you in the top or bottom half, <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. And what we do to our children is setting them up for a lifetime. 
So what we're seeing is something we can expect to see for some period of time. And today, this, this gets right to the industry. Today in America, we're eating just a little over two and a half ounces of beef per person per day. It's the lowest consumption level it's been since 1955. Lots of possible reasons for that. Economics, obviously one of them. Lifestyle changes, obviously another. But frankly, we've been told to eat less beef. We've been told to restrict red meat. At the same time, we're eating almost 130 pounds of caloric sweeteners per person per year. This is all sweeteners, sugars, corn syrups, molasses, syrups, you know, the whole bit. You know, that's, that's more than twice the beef consumption per day. That's not counting the 10.6 ounces of other carbohydrate starch, obviously, that we're also consuming per day. So, of course, the diabetes is the result of the red meat, right? The health problems were fa that's the red meat, right? We'll blame the burger in the Big Mac, not the three pieces of bread, the special sauce, the mega supersized fries, and the gallon sized tankard of sugar water. It's the beef. All right. Now, some of us have experience with plant nutrition. So we do field plots, we do greenhouse work, we know what we have to do to set up good experiments so that we can get good data. Obviously, we're familiar with animal nutrition, and we're familiar with things like the NRC feed tables. Okay? Are the dietary guidelines for human beings of equivalent rigor? Not on your life. And we need to get people to understand that, everyone here, first of all, and then let's spread the message. And Adele will talk more about that. But again, I can hear people talking. I can hear what you're thinking. What does he know? He's just a forage agronomist. Well, I may not have gone to such prestigious land-grant universities as exist here in Virginia. I am the product of the University of Georgia and the University of Kentucky. Don't hate me. But one thing they did make sure is that I could read before they gave me a degree. I know, they're real stringent. In the dietary guidelines themselves, you can find this little nugget. In a document that's proposing how we should eat to avoid chronic illness and obesity, they say that these dietary patterns have not been specifically tested for health benefits. They started doing this in 1980, and they still don't know if it will work. But trust us. Really? How does science work? The way science ought to work is that if we're going to form some new law or new idea, first we guess. You'd like to dress it up a little bit more, but that's what it comes down to. And then what we start to do is say, if our guess is right, what sorts of observations or data should we see? Okay? And then we set about doing observations, making experiments, and see if what we find. If what we find disagrees, then we're wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. That's how science progresses. We form hypotheses. We test with rigor to refute them, and when we refute them, we know that's not right, and we move on. If we fail to refute, we fail to refute. We continue testing. So far, so good. Doesn't mean we've proved it. Just means we haven't disproven it. In that simple statement is the key to science. It does not make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It does not make any difference how smart you are. Who made the guess or what his name is, if it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong, and this has not operated in the realm of human nutrition for the last half century. So I've just said, you know, if we find contradictory evidence, then we should consider the hypothesis disproven. So the hypothesis of record is that fat in the diet, especially saturated fat in the diet, causes heart disease and leads to other common chronic illnesses. So let's see if we can find from the literature some contradictory observations. Here's the first one. Dietary cholesterol, in fact, has no meaningful association with total cholesterol in your blood. 
And this is an old observation going back to the 30s and has never been really all that controversial. What you eat has very little effect on what's in your blood. So why are we told to restrict cholesterol? Well, it was felt to be too confusing for poor Americans to be told that they need to worry about what's in your blood, but it doesn't matter what you eat. So to keep the message simple, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so total cholesterol is unrelated to coronary heart disease risk, and low-density lipoprotein cholesterol is a marginal risk factor for heart disease. I'm showing some citations. Obviously, you can't write these down. They will be captured in the video that's being prepared. They're also published in the proceedings. If you want them, let me know. Again, contact information will be available at the end of this talk or back on the agri um, the King's Agriseeds uh, booth. So how many people have had doctors talk to them about their total cholesterol level? How many people have had their doctors talk to them about their LDL cholesterol level? How do you square those two with your observations? Higher total cholesterol, in fact, is associated with greater longevity for women and seniors. Okay, maybe I need to translate this just a little bit. Women, doesn't matter how old you are, the best evidence that we have is that the higher your cholesterol, the longer you'll live. So how many have been told they need to go on a cholesterol-lowering medication? Now, remember I said women, okay? Men gets a little trickier, okay? And again, one size fits all is not appropriate. But the best evidence for men is once you cross that threshold of 60, 65, somewhere in there, if you have not been diagnosed with actual heart disease, not high cholesterol, but heart disease, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you'll live. Lower total cholesterol is in fact associated with a greater cancer mortality. As long as they've been looking at this, They've noticed this association, but they were so sure that health, that the heart disease was the number one killer, that they said, that's what we should focus on. And they just sort of ignored this inconvenient truth. Saturated fat does not cause heart disease. Saturated fat and total fat consumption is positively associated with longevity. Again, a translation, the more fat, the more saturated fat you eat, the longer you'll live, <laughs> and the happier you'll be probably too. And those two are probably not unrelated. A low fat diet, which is what kind of diet? High carbohydrate diet, will in fact increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. You understand? We're told to eat a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet to lower our risk of heart disease, yet the science says by doing so, we will likely increase our risk of heart disease, and we'll talk about that going forward. High-fat, therefore, low-carbohydrate diets produce greater weight loss, better blood glucose control, and reduce cardiovascular disease risks for those people who find themselves in this metabolic syndrome cluster. So what's the heart healthy portion of this meal? Yeah, yeah, that, that definitely, this is probably okay. It would be better with some butter on it. <laughs> so a couple things to, to point here. You may see the heart check logo on products in the grocery store. What you may or may not know is that the food manufacturer has to pay to have that placement. It's a revenue stream to the American Heart Association. That's how they show up on Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> Second point that I had to learn is the American Heart Association is not a patient advocacy group. It's a special interest group for cardiologists. And again, that's not a subtle distinction. <laughs> okay, so we've been taught to consider saturated fat and animal fat as if they're synonymous, right? Mean the same thing. It's not true. Animal fat is a mixture of fatty acids. Some of them are saturated, some of them are unsaturated, some of them are monounsaturated. 
Okay? If you look at beef tallow, for example, you're 40, you're 50% saturated, 42% monounsaturated, 4% polyunsaturated. If you run the numbers, you get to the point where you realize that if you were to eat beef tallow, rendered beef fat, and restrict carbohydrate, you would improve your blood lipid profile. You would lower your heart disease risk. And lard would be even better. This thing on? Okay. Now, unfortunately, many of us get our dietary advice from our physicians. And physicians are not well trained in human nutrition. It hasn't been a point of emphasis in their training. So a survey was done where they asked some general questions. By the time you leave here, you'll know more than the vast number of physicians that were surveyed. 93% did not know that a low fat, therefore, come on, work with me, high carbohydrate diet, in general, would increase blood triglycerides. 75% did not know that a low fat, therefore, high carbohydrate diet would decrease HDL cholesterol. 50% thought that that low fat, high carbohydrate diet would not change HDL cholesterol. And 50% did not know that carbohydrate was the diet component most likely to raise triglycerides. It also lowers HDL cholesterol. Isn't that interesting? Raising HDL cholesterol, lowering blood triglycerides, represents significant reduction in heart disease risk. Those are targets you're supposed to go for. And the best evidence is that by eating saturated fat, by restricting, by eating animal products, by restricting carbohydrates, you'll achieve those goals and to a degree better than the medications that we currently have available and without side effects. And it gets more. Um, there's, there's this thing I mentioned earlier about LDL particle sizes. LDL is not a uni low density lipoprotein molecule or particles are not uniform. They vary in size and those differences have health implications. And so this gentleman, uh, Dr. Krauss, is a leader in the whole lipoprotein uh, area, particle area, and he describes LDL as falling into d two distinct patterns, uh, a disease call a pattern uh, B and a low risk pattern A, and the amount of fat you have in your diet influences the proportion of people. You shift that pattern in individuals based on diet, and fat in the diet influences that. So on the average American diet, quote unquote, of 35% of calories, one in three men will have that disease producing pattern B type. On a diet of 45% fat, proportion drops to only one man in five. That's a huge impact. On a diet of only 10% fat, two out of every three men will have that disease producing pattern. So eating those extremely low fat diets that are advocated by some, the plant-based kind of diet, you are significantly increasing your risk of heart disease. Again, we were told to eat this way to avoid obesity. We were told to eat this way to avoid these chronic illnesses. We've all been unwitting subjects in a long observational study, the hypothesis of which is that a low fat, high carbohydrate diet will reduce obesity, diabetes, and the other so-called diseases of civilization. In my view, it hasn't worked out all that well. Marvelous understatement. You know, anytime you do research with human beings, you have to get their consent. So thank you for participating. Frequently, they have to be paid. So I hope you're making good use of the check that's being sent to you for your participation and that of your children and your parents and your grandchildren. Can we get the, the low-fat proponents to apologize is another quote. Oops. Yeah, probably not. The sum of the evidence against saturated fat over the past half century amounts to this. One, the early trials that condemned it were unsound. That's kind. The epidemiological data showed no negative association when you actually looked at it. Not what they said about the data, but when you actually looked at the data. 
And the saturated fats effects on LDL cholesterol when properly measured in the subfractions, that pattern A, pattern B we just talked about, is neutral. And a significant body of clinical trials over the past decade has demonstrated the absence of any negative effect of saturated fat on heart disease, obesity, or diabetes. Why are we told to restrict it? The evidence doesn't support it. So you can tell when idols are being worshipped because human beings are being sacrificed. Is there anything more pitiful than a life lost in the service of some unsound belief? At some point, we just have to get really serious about this. Because people are being sacrificed to a belief system. And that belief system is that we shouldn't be eating animal products. An extension of that is you shouldn't be growing animals. We shouldn't be owning animals. There's a whole train of belief systems here. And you're entitled to your belief system. I'm not here to you know, beat anybody into agreement. I'm just here to say that if that's where you stand, then I have the right to challenge that belief system from the evidence. We have over 150 years of observational evidence of where medical missionaries and physicians went from Europe and North America out to serve remote peoples that were still eating their traditional diets. What these physicians, who were well-trained, were uniformly struck by was the virtual absence of many diseases that they had been taught to recognize. And they started talking about these as diseases of civilization, which is an obviously arrogant and problematic term. So that changed to Western diseases, but now they're showing up everywhere. <laughs> so that's no longer accurate. And now we have this understanding of metabolic syndrome. You have one of these diseases, you tend to get other diseases from this list. And what they saw was these diseases that were showing up in these remote peoples were always following the introduction of refined sugar and refined flour, which they're the perfect trade goods, so that explains why they came in. And when that came into their diet, all these diseases showed up. And you didn't have to wait for a generation for it to show up. It showed up quickly. Now, conventional wisdom says that, OK, these are all related. But now we're saying the, the common story is that obesity is what promotes these other diseases in some way. But if you follow some of the thoughts of some of the researchers, they're suggesting more like insulin resistance belongs in the middle. And in fact, obesity is one of these associated symptoms of insulin resistance. But by the way, not all heavy or obese people are insulin resistant. And, and heavy and people who are overweight yet insulin sensitive are at no greater risk for heart disease and other chronic illnesses than their lean insulin sensitive counterparts. Not everyone who's lean is insulin sensitive. And the lean people who are insulin resistant are at in fact a greater risk of heart disease than their insulin resistant obese counterparts. Interesting. And of course, none of that impacts policy. So here's some symptoms of metabolic syndrome. If you have abdominal obesity, a waist circumference over 40 inches in men or over 35 inches in women, sorry, <laughs> biology isn't fair. Serum triglycerides above 150 milligrams per deciliter, HDL cholesterol of 40 milligrams per deciliter or lower in men, or 50 or lower in women. Blood pressure of 130 or over 85 or greater, a fasting blood glucose of 110 uh, or above. Some even drop that to 100, but this is the definition from the National Cholesterol Education Program. If you have three of those five symptoms, you qualify for a metabolic syndrome diagnosis. And if you have that, well, let's take a step back. If our likelihood of contracting a particular disease increases once we already have type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, then it's reasonable assumption that high blood sugar and or insulin is involved in the disease process. And if blood sugar and insulin are involved, and then we have to accept the possibility that refined and easily digestible carbohydrates are as well. If you have metabolic syndrome, you are twice as likely to develop heart disease and five times as likely to develop diabetes as someone who does not. 
So we saw that figure before that half of adult Americans are going to be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Treating that upstream earlier would be a, a good strategy. And then there's a link between hyperinsulinemia, chronically elevated insulin levels, insulin resistance, and cancer. Um, and without reading the whole thing, I'll just make the point that there are plausible biologic, uh, biochemical, physiological explanations for this relationship. And people are looking at the relationship between obesity and, and cancer. They're looking at the relationships between diabetes type 2 and cancer. Diabetics are an increased risk of contracting several forms of cancer. People who have excess body fat, uh, it's been estimated between one quarter and one half the occurrence of many frequent cancers uh, are due to having excess body fat. The list is growing. It's a large and growing body of evidence implicating insulin and insulin-like growth factor in cancer, and it's causing a lot of people to stay up at night thinking about it. Of course, you've heard about all this on the news, right? These kinds of increased risk factors are orders of magnitude greater than any of the public, you know, association data that says red meat cancer. Right? The, it's phenomenal. Um, if you've lost anyone to cancer, if you have a history in your family, please pay attention to this. Um, you can go on YouTube and find this, this video. Uh, Craig Thompson is the president and CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. If the model of cancer is that that's because of genetic mutation, then the question is, why don't we all get cancer? Because so many mutations are occurring every single day in the body, everyone's body, that we should all have cancer and we don't. What's going on? He's talking about this. And at one point in his presentation, he says that where your calories come from matter. Overeating fat does not increase your cancer rate, he says. Overeating carbohydrates dramatically increases cancer rate. Okay, so let's look at overeating. Maybe that's that willpower thing they keep talking about. Oh, but what happens if carbohydrate-based diets inherently induce overeating? And protein puts you somewhere in between. That's why we're going to have a huge debate about these carbohydrate-based diets. I would hope so. Haven't heard it yet, but I would hope so. The problem here was that later in the question and answer, he was asked about what happens if you have a history of, of heart disease in your family. And he shifts right into the old paradigm and says, well, if you have a history of heart disease, then it's really important for you to eat a low-fat diet not understanding that he's just said that they need to eat a low-fat diet, which he had earlier, I'm uh, sorry, a uh, high-carbohydrate diet, which he had just said earlier would dramatically increase their risk of cancer. Uh, that's, that's the weird world we've now found ourselves in, and, and we need to confront it. So these are the leading causes of death per the CDC, I think it's 2011 data. So these are the leading causes. If you remember that list of, of related disorders, if I underline them, these are diseases that have some plausible link to metabolic syndrome. If you total those up, it comes up to over one and a half million people. Now, not all, I'm not saying that, but that's a significant area I should focus on and then just overt honesty requires that I throw in two more causes of death if we're gonna have a conversation about health care in the United States. Um, I have trouble getting my mind around a, a one and a half million number, what that means. So there are four days that are considered the, the bloodiest days in American history. The Battle of Antietam, 1862. Over 3,600 Americans died on that day. 9-11, we lost almost 3,000 American people because they weren't all from America. They just happened to be here. D-Day, America lost almost 2,500 people. Pearl Harbor, we lost 2,400 people. Single day. If you take that one and a half million and you divide it by 365, over 4,100 people every single day are dying from diseases that have some arguable connection to metabolic syndrome every single day. 
So the evidence, dietary fat, whether saturated or not, does not cause heart disease. Carbohydrates do because of their effect on the hormone insulin and refined carbohydrates, starches and sugars, are the most likely dietary causes of cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and other common chronic diseases of modern times. There's no meaningful association between meat consumption and cancer. In fact, the evidence is that positive health outcomes are associated with the consumption of animal products. There is no data to support a vegetarian diet from a health outcome basis. Doesn't matter. It's not science. It's, it's now political and it's belief system driven. This was an opinion piece published in October in Wall Street Journal by the author of Big uh, Fat Surprise. And basically what she's lining out is that the people on the committee, while they admit that low fat diets, high carbohydrate diets are probably not a good idea, they're still going to go ahead with them. They just can't let go, seemingly. And the challenge to the beef industry is for a long time we've tried to say, but we're lean, don't, don't go after us, we're, we're okay. Well, again, it doesn't matter. They're going to shift the goalposts on you. So now it's our turn. And, and this great philosopher of our time said that to sit back hoping that someday, some way, someone will make things right is to go on feeding the crocodile, hoping that he will eat you last but eat you he will. And now it's your turn. The people who came up with a report that's going to go to USDA and HHS to inform them about the science so that USDA and HHS can form the next round of dietary policy that will govern all policy for the next five years are prepared, they, their recommendation they dropped on us at the last minute is to remove even lean meat from the healthy diet definition. But I'm here to say that beef is heart healthy. I'm here to say that beef is health food and that in fact meat is medicine. So what next? Become educated. I hope today starts the process. I'm grateful that the forage organization decided to take a day and spend a significant part of it on this because I think that this is of critical interest to the forage industry. Mention some books. One book would be Gary Taubes' book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, uh, but perhaps a more accessible um, treatment of the Subject is Nina Teicholz's book, The Big Fat Surprise. Again, there are some copies at the back. Recommend it completely. Gr gain, I was going to say grain experience. <laughs> uh, gain experience if necessary. If when I listed symptoms of metabolic syndrome, you started getting a little nervous, <laughs> then look into it. There are many, many forms of a carbohydrate-restricted diet that you could implement on your own. The one that I followed when I reversed my condition, which was obese and trending towards prediabetes, was this book written by Michael and Mary Dan Eads called Protein Power Life Plan. It's a bit old. You may still be able to find it. A friend of mine found it in a used bookstore in Singapore. Um, so you can find it a little easier on Amazon, I guess. Uh, challenge the narrative. We're all members of our community. We interact with people who are not in agriculture. Learn some things that you can help people learn more. So if somebody starts talking about Meatless Mondays, you can start talking to them about that. And we'll give some more information as we go along today. Find your position of influence. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity that VFGC gave me to, to be here. I'm grateful for Barenbroek USA for the support they give me to come out to the forage industry and talk to you about the value of your product in the human diet. Find your own. We're all responsible for the care and feeding of at least one human being, right? So start there. Some of us have an even greater responsibility. That's for our children and our family. Start there. We have to learn some new things, but we can do this, really. We can do it. So at this point, I've probably gone on too long. I apologize for that. Um, there is time. I think now because of a break. Uh, also, there'll be question and answers through, uh, at the end of the day and throughout the day. You can find me 
Um, and again, you can contact me. I try to write things. I try to post things. I try to keep the information flowing. So you can find me at any one of these uh, locations. So thank you. All right. We're sitting here. So for anyone who didn't hear that, uh, the question is, are there videos? And some of my presentations have been posted. This video will be posted. I don't know the timeline on that. But if you go to YouTube and you just type in my last name, you'll find a bunch of videos that have been posted there. Well, there's one that I gave to the Kentucky Cattlemen last year there. And so that would be a place to start. This video will be posted on a, a YouTube channel called BP, like Virginia Tech, Forages, all one word. If you search that, there's a whole bunch of videos about forages. All the videos from today's conference will be posted there. Thank you. Another question for Peter? So the question is, how does Crestor fit into my thinking? Um, well, I could show you the data that supports the marketing claim. I believe the best number you could look at is the number needed to treat. What that is, is how many people would you have to treat with this drug in order to get a benefit? Okay. If you're treating people who have the, the H. pylori, you know, um, ulcers, if you give them the specific antibiotic, almost, it's almost a one for one. Almost everyone you treat with that drug benefits. When you start talking about people getting all classes of statins, and you're talking about people who are not at high risk, who have not had heart disease, the number is well above 100 that need to be treated in order for one person to benefit. And the best evidence that we have is that the number of people who will have adverse effects will outnumber the number of people who will benefit. So I guess that's my answer. What does it mean to benefit? It means to prevent a heart attack. But of course, that's measured in terms of adjusting cholesterol levels, which are unrelated. But that's the measurement that they go by. In some countries where they have um, centralized controlled medicine, there's actually inducements to get physicians to prescribe statins to a certain percentage of their population. That's how they get bonuses, is if they achieve certain target numbers. So it's a very scary thing. I, I just, I guess that's enough on. Unless somebody has an, yeah. Yeah, right now there's a distinction being made between meat and processed meat. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that you can get. Meat is the most common meat that there's processing of some sort, but there's a certain level of processing that's apparently okay, and then there's some level that isn't. I'll talk about that this afternoon, um, but I think that that's another confounded observation. Like nobody eats the hot, well, nobody, I do. Uh, few people eat the hot dog without the bread around it. Few people, you know, a, a certain number of people slather on a bunch of condiments that also have other ingredients. What else are they eating the hot dog with? And, and how did we get that association in the first place? Adele will talk about food frequency questionnaires. Let me briefly describe that process. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. Like every other year or so, we send participants a questionnaire that says, on average, how much of this do you eat a day? OK, well, one, that's problematic. <laughs> Nobody can remember that accurately. If you've ever kept a food diary, you know this. If you don't write it down as you eat it, it's hard to be accurate on a daily basis. Okay? Number two, they've demonstrated that people are biased in what they write down. 
they think they know what the answer should be. And so they write down lower amounts than they actually eat of various things. And then on top of that, you have this weird thing where pizza is in the meat group. And ice cream shows up in the meat group. So, so how they process the unreliable data is itself questionable. And then when they get to the end of the day and they analyze this, they come up with meaningless risk factors next to no risk, but they blow them up and say, oh, look at this increased risk. Well, yeah, you increased it from one, which means no difference, to 1.2 or something like that, when we need to be looking like more like 20 times. One, one more question. So the question was, it seems like this science has been out there for a while, and I agree, although it continues to advance. Uh, it, given that it's been out there for a while, why hasn't and or when will USDA and others start acting on it? I think that's part of the conversation we'll be having as we go on through the day. Number one, I don't like talking about USDA as if it's a monolith, because too many people aren't involved in this process of creating the guidelines. And so they don't, I mean, there, do, there, were, there were people working at Beltsville, Maryland, on carbohydrates and human nutrition. And they knew everything that I've just told you, but it didn't matter, because it went against the narrative. So at some point, I think what's happening is we live in an age when we no longer have to get past the gatekeepers. We can now run around them. And I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to look for those influential people we know in our own industry. I keep thinking that one day I'll find the person who's politically connected in the right way, or I'll find the person that knows the right people, and that person will have had the personal experience that gets them interested in the topic, that gets them fired up, and then they can take it the next way. Um, I'm, I'm reasonably certain that I'm not equipped for politics, <laughs> but people who are could take the information and start asking, you say you're doing this based on science, and yet you're not considering all the relevant science. You say you're doing this on science, and yet there's these contradictory observations. So I think there's a movement taking place, but the first thing we have to do is we have to stop what, at least to me and others, appears to be the track for the 2015 dietary guidelines. All right, all right this is a good place to stop. I'd like to, um, I'd like to